you still cheered more for Amanda. Like, the applause meter for Amanda was like here, mine was like, there's some. <laughs> and rightfully so, rightfully so. <laughs> Hey, uh, Amanda was right. Uh, for, as far as the baptism goes, I have this recollection that some people have told me they're interested in getting baptized. Who they were, I have no idea. So if that was you, we want to get together very quickly. It's not a like long lesson or anything. I want to know who's interested in getting baptized and answer any questions that you have about baptism. So we're going to do that right after service. Immediately after service, we'll just get together at uh, one of the tables up here. So We'll get together up here as uh, folks come up to pray. We'll meet. We'll get rid of everybody else. Unless all of you want to get baptized, then you just stay at your table. But so if you are interested, if you are curious, and what Amanda said uh, about baptism, to, to be very clear, she said you don't have to be baptized to go to heaven. Well, yes, in that you don't earn. There's not like check marks that God's like, check baptism, check went to church. Check applauded for Chris more than Amanda. Check. God doesn't have that sort of checklist of works to get you into heaven because the Bible says very clearly we are saved by grace through faith, not by works, so that no one can boast. Because if you were saved by the works you had to do, you could say, I was baptized by Pastor Chris. Which people would say, why does that mean anything at all? But, but some people do that. Some people w will brag about, I did this and this to go to heaven. God doesn't want any bragging or boasting. However, if you are on your way to heaven, if you are saved, and you say, well, I don't have to be baptized, so why should I? That's kind of like saying, I'm married, so why do I have to wear my ring? I don't have to tell everybody that I'm married. Why can't I just pretend that I'm not married? To which your wife would say, well, maybe you're not married. <laughs> you want to act like it? Why don't we act like it? <laughs> so if you are following Jesus, then baptism is part of it for every believer, for every one of us. It is right from the get-go. We are following Jesus and, uh, and we tell the world. Um, so baptism is next week. I'm excited for it. Come and, uh, and join me up at table right over here after service for that. Now, this morning we have something special. Mike's going to bring us the word. Not that, well, that's special too. But we have something special before that. We, uh, uh, you guys have been praying for uh, a couple of our mission trips. We sent a, uh, a team to Romania. My, uh, my daughter was on that team to, to Romania. And uh, we also sent a team to Haiti again this year. This is how many years in a row have we gone to Haiti? Eight years in a row, we gone to Haiti, and and that's uh, that's applause for God because God is good. God is good. so. Uh, and this team, this church, just so you know, this church, we are a church on mission. That group of uh, young adults who's been coming every week, they're actually at retreat this week. If you're wondering how come we don't see the red lanyards this week, they're on retreat this week. But the uh, they're here, and uh, and what we're doing with them, we're teaching them about missional church. As a church, we believe that God has called us to mission, that Jesus' great commission for us, when he said, all authority in heaven and earth is given to me, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to do all that I have commanded you. And he's, when he called us to go, we take that seriously. We, we take that seriously across the street at the barbecue. We take that seriously down the road at Refuge Recovery. We take that into our homes, into our lives. We are missional church. And we do things a little differently. Uh, when, uh, when, when friends ask me, like, what's your church like? I always say, well, it's different. <laughs> and, but the, what, the thing I always say, it's like a mission trip every Sunday. And I love a mission trip, but that's what we're about. Every Sunday morning, this is, this is mission here, and we're all part of it. But this isn't the only mission. We send them out. So Julie's going to come up. Uh, Julie Gibbs. Welcome, Julie Gibbs. Come up. And uh, Julie and Steve are... You got more applause than me, too. <laughs> so... <laughs> Thanks, Joseph. Just look up. Hey, uh, these guys are going to share about the, the trip to, to Haiti. So I won't take any more of their time. It is theirs. Just, just they're, all, they're all prettier than you, Chris. That's what happened. Good morning, everybody. 
Thank you so much for your support for us. We, um, we had an amazing trip, and uh, I wanna sh we want to show you some slides about it. And uh, we were gone in June for nine days, having some technical difficulties with our slides. Okay, everybody, let's pray. Father God, thank you that we get to come and share about this trip and how awesome it was and how awesome you worked. Lord God, could you please just touch the PowerPoint and make it work so that we can show off the slides of all that happened down there. You're amazing, God. You can even do techie stuff, and I thank you for that. And um, thank you also for Joe and Alma, uh, for your blessed servants, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. So we'll wing it just a little bit. So... Um, we started going down to Haiti in 2010. That was the year of their big earthquake. And um, so we've been going, I've been going every year since then, so eight years, but we've been nine times. I've been nine times because the first time we went is when we met, actually. Steve and I. <laughs> so, so we could take the whole time and, and uh, talk about that, but. Um, <laughs> But that was, we won't do that. But that was uh, 32 years ago, and uh, that's where we met on a two-month missionary internship. And then, um, and ever since then, Haiti's been in our hearts. And if you want to hear more about that, we'll tell you another time. Just come and ask. Um, okay, God, we're waiting. So, um, so anyway, uh, this year was an amazing trip. We um, we had 18 that ended up going this year. Half of the team came from California and half from Florida. Well, kind of half. Eight from here and 10 from Florida. And um, the, the Florida team was kind of headed up by Dr. Kim Rittman, who, is, who has gone with me every year for the past seven years. And um, so she's been a, an integral part in making this, this team happen. And so um, we had this year the biggest team ever in the history of us going and um, everybody thinks oh it's a medical mission trip so it's, it must be all doctors and nurses and such and but it's not it really isn't let me tell you who was with us this year the 18 included two doctors one nurse practitioner three nurses one student nurse two minors two senior citizens one engineer one active and one retired military, one, you know, one youth ministry leader, one speech therapist, one financial advisor, and one realtor. So, God used every single one of these people in, in the perfect way, just like it, you read in the Bible when Paul talks about the different parts of the church, you know, the eyes, the ears, and nose. There's just different parts that have a, an important part, and really these people... So many of them didn't know what part they were going to play till they got there and they saw where God put them. And that's what's really, really cool about these mission trips. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, one of the big questions people ask us every year is, well, what kind of things do you treat down there? And... Um, a whole gamut of things. I mean, if you can imagine people who don't get medical care all year long and then they, they find out there's a free clinic that they can get to by walking four, five, six hours or by uh, loading onto the top of a, a bus or a truck or something to get there, um, people have an array of things. The, probably the most common things are, is high blood pressure. Um, uh, some other things are... are um, some, we did some minor surgeries. There's this little boy that got a stick pierced through his, into his temple, and he was completely infected. And it had been that way for two weeks, and had we not come, it would have continued to be a problem. Um, but uh, he got, that, uh, got help from our, uh, one of the docs that was with us is a, is a, was a, is a retired um, surgeon. And so he did a little work on him and helped. We helped him. Um, there's a lot of asthma. You see a lot of kids with pneumonia. Um, you see a lot of um, skin issues. A lot of people who 
Um, people who have cancer who we really can't do anything to help. Um, I think we're almost there. It's pretty exciting. If there weren't that big black spot in the side. Steve says this is my fault. Come on. That's not working at all. We're going to take a technology break. We're taking a technology break. Back to our regularly scheduled program, everyone. <laughs> hey, just because you work for Jesus doesn't mean everything goes right for you. If, if any of you didn't know that, then you haven't been hanging around us very long. <laughs> but uh, no, we all still live through life the way everybody else does. We all still work through. I, I run a, uh, I get to run a mobile app, which is incredible, but it doesn't go easy for you just because you're working for Jesus. But he always comes through one way or another. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to get into the word. What I told Julie is we're going to get into the word together and going to give our amazing tech team a little time to make it work. Okay, so the magic is I have to stand here and not move because when I'm up here... Okay, you guys want to do it now? Yeah, do it now. <laughs> Welcome back, Steve and Julie Gibbs. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Get the antenna. Oh, my goodness. There we go. Okay, so Joe, I'm just going to say click and uh, just advance it, okay? Okay, click. Landing in Port-au-Prince, click. The, the California part of the team, click. That is some public transportation. That is called a top-top. And every, every bus, every truck that's been converted into a bus because it has a back on and they every put moped. benches in it, <laughs> every moped, everything, has, will have something to protect it on there. And usually it's the name of... Jesus, it'll say Lord, it'll say praise God, it'll say something because they are very aware of the spiritual world there, not like us in the United States who can ignore it because it's a little bit quieter. Sometimes it's rocky. And, but this, this bus actually had all of the superhero fighters on it with Rocky and... and Chuck Norris and Chun Li. Yeah. <laughs> Click. Uh, lady going to market, next chickens going to market. I'm glad you can't see that up close because they weren't live. They were. This is um, just an outside market and behind it you can see the garbage dump. Yeah. So this is the whole team that I was describing and you'll see um, Pastor Bastia who is the pastor of Calvary Chapel Cane there in Haiti and his sister there on the far left. Um, just an awesome man of God with a huge vision for what can be done there in Cane to help the people. And his sister, um, she looks like she's about 15, but she's really 30. Um, and she is a uh, nursing assistant, and so she helped do, do vital signs. Click. This is first thing in the morning. We triage all the patients, um, which is probably one of the hardest things to do as a nurse or a doctor to decide um, who, who's the sickest to go first. Okay, next. This is doing the vital signs. Uh, the little ones get weighed. Everybody gets their blood pressure and their temperature taken, and et cetera. Click. These are our doctors. Two doctors this year, Dr. Kim, Dr. Rich, and then Tiffany was a, is a pediatric nurse practitioner who is awesome to have on the team this year. She came from Florida. And then Dr. Phyllis, who's a, um, a physician there in Haiti, who we hire, we've hired uh, multiple times when we've gone. He's a fantastic man of, um, to have on the team. Next. 
After, after they see the doctors, so that's the, that's the order. They, they get their vital signs taken, they go see the doctor, and then they go for a prayer. And that was Snoop Dogg. <laughs> Showed up in 80. No, th this guy, the, the bag he's holding, he makes these amazing bags out of candy wrappers and sells them. And so they pull them right out of the trash and make these bags, but he was a great guy. So that was one of the people I got to pray with. And um, so as soon as, once they've been seen by the doctor and they're waiting for the prescriptions, everybody gets prayed with. So we saw 1,348 people. So we probably prayed with at least 1,000 of them. And um, so it was, it was a long day, a lot of prayer, but they sure need it. So. Then, then they go to the pharmacy and they get their prescriptions filled. Um, a lot of... Uh, Medications were donated by people to take with us, but we, we spent, I think it was $7,000 um, that was raised in our fundraisers and donations um, on medications that we took to Haiti, which um, getting them into the country it was a miracle in itself. Um, every year we have so much difficulty getting them in. We hide them in our suitcases, um, and this year, we did that again, and I was so stressed out, and God really taught me to let it go and let him, because he was trying to teach me that it's his trip. If he wants those drugs in the country, he's going to get them. If they're not going to get in the country, then they won't, and we'll just do what we have to do. But, the, <laughs> but this year, um, not even one of our bags was searched. So it was a huge answer to prayer. Next. These are some of our patients. Um, the one in the bottom, um, you can see the little girl getting a breathing treatment for pneumonia. The top right there, the little boy, uh, very malnourished, um, terrible, um, cold and wheezing, and he was a sick little kid. Next. And then, <laughs> aren't they adorable? Next. This woman, uh, while she was waiting for, waiting to be seen, um, she collapsed outside, and so they carried her into our treatment room. Um, and Leslie, one of the nurses with us, she was working in the treatment room that day. She uh, didn't have any paper, so she wrote the women's blood pressure on her hand. 285 over 140, if you know anything about blood pressure. Absolutely amazing that this woman didn't stroke out. And um, this is her sitting in the chair. Afterwards, she got some an IV and some medicine, and... Miracle, <laughs> just a miracle. Next. We hired nine translators who were fantastic. Next. We did two mobile clinics, which was a new thing this year, um, which really almost doubled the number of patients we saw in a day. We split the team, so half stayed in Kane at the church, and half went out to um, a, a school. And so we did that two days in a row, two different schools, and um, these are just some pictures of the team getting in the van and then the kids peeking through the blinds at the school watching us, watching everything we did in the pharmacy. They're like all eyes. What are you doing in there? And uh, want to tell them about our security guard? Oh, gosh. So this guy, this one-armed bandit to, to, my, to the right there, he was at the first away clinic and they all came back and they go, Wow, it was, it was pandemonium, but this guy showed up, and he was crazy. He was yelling at everybody. He had his machete. I'm like, really? And then so the next day, we went to the other clinic. They had actually worked out a deal where they, they paid him to come direct traffic. And he turned out to be like the night. I mean, he kept everybody in line because it was just it's crazy with the amount of people there. Just everybody wants to get care, and they're all pushing and shoving and wanting to climb in and get ahead. But um, he was just the nicest guy. I prayed with him. He's actually a Christian. He, he was a security guard. He got his arm blown off by a bandit <laughs> 10 years ago. He still had buckshot in his, in his skin. And, but um, he was a big, big help. Great guy to have, a, have on the trip. So this was Vacation Bible School. We did this the last day before we left. And uh, it was a half-day program. And the kids got to hear about Jesus. They heard that he keeps his promises they learned, they got to do uh, crafts, and they got to do singing, and they had such a fun time, and they did all kinds of activities outside, and um, then at the end, they got to have lunch, which is a big deal, getting to have a meal, 
um, because the families that are doing well in Haiti are, um, they get a, one meal a day. That's, that's a family that's successful in Haiti in that area. And so for them to get a free meal, a huge bowl of food, um, and we even splurged and put some chicken in it, which was, is something the kids in Haiti rarely get, get meat. That's not something that they can afford. And then bottom right corner is the, um, the, the youth that helped to serve it and wash all those dishes, by the way, no paper plates. Um, and the youth uh, from the church helped serve it. Next. This is just a walk in the neighborhood. It's kind of hard to see from where you're sitting. Um, just going to people's homes and walking around um, in their own, um, this is their habitat, you know, their, their wooden. And, and this home was actually kind of a nice house that wood sides, not just um, thrown together. Next. Plans for the future, the top left. That, we're standing on the property. Um, that's Dr. Kim Rittman and I um, standing on the property of the future medical clinic um, someday when we've raised the money and get the plans together. And the bottom right is uh, the market that was um, built by, it's, it's just a freestanding market where people can set up their wares and sell. Um, that was built by the Calvary Chapel in Burbank. Um, and that will be complete probably in the next three months. They've got to lay down stone and finish the outhouses. Next. This is Calvary Chapel Cane, and uh, that's them. They say hi. They say hi and thank you for, um, for praying for us, for sending the team. And, um, yeah, they, it, it, they're very, very grateful to be able to have a medical team come and help them. Next. And next year, we'll be going February. That's actually the coast of Haiti, by the way. It's a gorgeous place. It's on the Caribbean. Um, so we'll be going February 2018. That's that. Um, just real quick, if you, if you want to see pictures um, in a better light, um, go to Facebook. Cal um, it'll be Haiti Medical Clinic. There's lots of them. So you'll have to either put my name in or put in Haiti. Kane Haiti. Come ask me if, if you didn't get that, but um, you can look at all of our pictures. Thank you very much for your prayer, for your donations, your support. God really blessed it. 1,348 patients, 22 people were saved, and an untold number of kids. So, yeah, it's pretty amazing. Hey there. There we go again with this microphone thing, man. I never get this right. Can I move this a little bit? You guys mind? Actually, that's, eh. Hi. <laughs> Can you tell we're a church plant? <laughs> Even though we launched in 2011, it's 2017, we're still getting things tweaked and moved around and adjusted. Uh, we don't have a perfect church service ever, in case you didn't notice, but we're not worried about that because we serve a perfect God, amen, has a perfect plan of salvation, perfect plan for everybody's life. This is still messed up. I'm never going to get it right, but anyway, so seventh inning stretch, um, <laughs> I love hearing the stories about what God does all across the world, um, especially with those kids, man. I mean, you see their faces. That's amazing, man. It's just, thank you for sharing that. Thanks for going. Thank you guys all for praying and for supporting. We're going to continue to do that. So, uh, we're in Nehemiah 9, Nehemiah chapter 9. And um, just to get right to it, give you a quick recap on where we've been. Uh, last week, we took a look at this prayer and confession uh, and repentance, right? Right? If you remember, they were all gathered together, the people, if you were here, they were all gathered together to hear the word for three hours, or some say six hours. And then for another three or six hours, they come, <clears throat> they confess, they prayed, and they worshiped the Lord. 
the, it was a response to the reading of the law of the Lord, the word of God. It was incredible. They, they revisited, recounted, they uh, remembered, they reflected upon, I'm not throwing all those R's together on purpose, it's just the way it's coming out, uh, their history as a nation. And if you remember, the focus was upon God's covenant, right? And what was highlighted, what was really highlighted in the prayer, as you watch the flow, is, there, uh, is this recurring theme, right? And it's God's faithfulness despite their failure as a people. Amen. And we saw it start off you, you, you addressing God, you, you alone are the Lord, you alone made the heavens, you give life, you are the Lord, you made a covenant with Abraham, you have fulfilled your promise, and so on. You heard the cry of your people as you, you saw their affliction. Um, you delivered them from Egypt, and from verses uh, 6 to 15, it's, it's you, you, you. Then it shifts gears uh, around verse 16. It says, and, and the unfaithfulness of the people, it shifts into they, they, they. They didn't listen. They didn't obey your word. They forgot your laws. They turned their backs on you and so on. Just a, a quick refresher. Um, if you remember Noah's message, how many remember Noah's message on covenant? Nobody remembers. Where were y'all last week? <laughs> Covenant, man, it's a binding agreement between two parties, right? And we talked about specifically um, covenants that, that God makes with his people and that how um, it's a serious thing. God takes it seriously and he always keeps up his end, even though we may fail, right? His people, us, you and I, children of Israel, they fail. God, covenant means everything to God. It's a promise. It's a commitment. Um, and it's binding He's bound, he, he cannot deny himself. I love the Bible says that. He doesn't change. So um, I'll connect that, uh, the flow of that in a minute here. We'll get back to that. But So what we learned is that Israel is going over this, their, this, this grand story, this history, right? It's spanning a huge length of time. Uh, and what's happening to them is they're starting all the way back at God's call upon their, nation, uh, their nation's patriarch, Abraham, right? Or Abram back then. And God's covenant with him. And what they see... Um, as they sort of travel back in time, if you will, all the way back from God calling Abraham, making him a promise, what they do is they trace God's faithfulness to that promise, right? Um, passed down through the generations despite all the failures of Abraham's descendants all the way up until the present day as they're standing there just awestruck at the realization that they are, they are standing in the very land that God promised to Abraham's descendants, right? And that they are alive and, and, and the, 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 having this chance again, a new start again. Remember the captivity, 70 years, right? In Babylon, the Persian kingdom, the return in Ezra, we saw that. And, <clears throat> excuse me, last week I referred to this as Israel's spiritual rearview mirror, if you remember that. And as they look back, and we look back with them, you see how each generation um, and people within those generations were spoken to and called by God and how they struggled to be faithful. They messed up. They lost their way. They, they as individuals and as a people as a whole. And you can see um, within the individual stories how each circumstance played out um, you see this overriding picture of God being faithful to his original covenant with Abraham, okay? As well as his faithfulness to each of his descendants. And so it's tied together. That's what I uh, want us to see before we move into chapter 10. Now, if you remember, uh, I gave you guys some homework. What was your homework? I can't remember that, but you don't remember covenant. Psalm 106 and 107. All right, who read it? Psalm 106, Psalm 107. All right, a whole three of you. Cool. Okay, I'm going to have Alma come up here and re recite it from memory. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> How you like them apples? Basically, we see this pattern, right? God delivered. God provided. God blessed. God guided them and got them through everything. They praised God. They soon turned from him back to their idols. They got in trouble, suffering the consequences. They cry out to God. He hears them, delivers them, 
They praise him. They serve him for a while. They go back again to their idols and so on and so forth. We talked about that. Um, but I'm going to do a brief recap. I'm going to add just a little more detail uh, in connection with last week to help us get the full picture. Uh, if you weren't last um, here last Sunday, that is, you can uh, go online and, and hear the message and uh, get caught up with us. But let me just give you the breakdown. Let me break this prayer and the reflective confession down uh, into sections. But um, let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for your word. Please speak to us this morning. Please teach us. Please be in our midst. Give us clear understanding of who you are. Who we are in you. Lord, we give you all the glory, all the praise, all the honor for everything, Lord. Please speak to our hearts, into our situations in our lives, Lord. Give hope, give light, give love. Lord, give peace. Convict us of our sin, but as I always say, convince us of your love and truth. Lord, help us to understand your covenant. Help us to understand your goodness, Lord. Help us to respond to that goodness today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. So take a look at, uh, really quickly, well, I'll just tell you, verses uh, 5 and 6 of chapter 9. We have them giving praise to the God of creation, the Lord over all, right? Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. You alone are the Lord. 7 and 8 says, praise to God who chose Abraham and made a covenant with him and his descendants. They say to God, Lord, you promised this land to Abraham and his descendants, and now we're, here we are. Here we are. Your promise is true. We are standing in it. Remember that? We're standing in the midst of it. They praise him in verse 9 through 15. They praise him for delivering Israel from Egypt and providing for them in the wilderness, right? You saw the affliction. You showed signs and wonders. You made a name for yourself. You divided the sea. You took care of their enemies. You let them or led them by day and by night. Remember the pillar of cloud? By day, the pillar of fire by night led them through the wilderness. Wilderness. You came down on Mount Sinai. He said, you gave your commandments. You gave them bread when they were hungry and water when they were thirsty. You, Lord, you were there the whole time speaking, performing miracles, leading the way, providing for them, being gracious to them. Amen. But, <laughs> takes a turn, but... Verses 16 and 17 shows this, this, this sinful, rebellious, unbelieving response of man to God's goodness. But they, but they, our fathers, acted arrogantly. They became stubborn and would not listen to your commandments. It goes on to say in verses 17 through 21 that through the, the stubborn rebellion of the people, God was still gracious and merciful because that's his nature. That is who he is. Okay, um, I was reading a commentary on this and it said, um, I think it was David Guzik, he said, we're often impressed at how patient God is with the sinner, right? How he somehow holds back his terrible judgment against those people who deserve it so badly. Yet it seems that his patient toward us is even greater. Those who have received so much more from him, but still act like Israel did. And uh, it was Alan Redpath who said, God's mercy with a sinner is only equaled and perhaps outmatched by his patience with the saints, with you and me. Then in verses uh, 22 through 31, we see this pattern or this cycle of Israel's relationship with God. And if you did your homework and you read Psalm 106 and 107, you saw this pattern. God shows his goodness to them. They get comfortable. Like I just said, they turn from him. God corrects them. He gives them a wake-up call, as it's been said. Uh, it says, you delivered them into the hand of their enemies. Then, desperate, right, they turn back to him in their desperation because they're in the consequences of their sin. It says, but as soon as they had rest, they did evil again before you. And it says, and, and many times, many times you rescued them according to your compassion." That's important. But it says in verse 30, yet they would not give ear. They did not listen or they didn't do what you told them. But then he says, 
Because of your compassion, you didn't make an end of them. Notice that the cycle gets worse, but God doesn't change. Right? In verses 32 through 37, as they're sitting in, they're living in the consequences of their sin, they realize that God himself is the only one that can deliver them from what all of this has done to them. So they turn to him and ask for help. They, they acknowledge the Lord. You have dealt faithfully, but we have done wickedly, they say. And then they cry out. We blew it. You allowed our enemies to take us captive. And even now, back in our own homeland, we're still slaves to foreigners. We're in great distress, he says. So please deliver us. Check out verse 38 with me. They make a decision, okay? Verse 38. Now, because of all this, this is chapter 9, 38. Now, because of all this, we are making an agreement in writing. And on the sealed document are the names of our leaders, our Levites, and our priests. The message, uh, Eugene Peterson says, because of all this, we are drawing up a binding pledge, a sealed document signed by our princes, our Levites, and our priests. A covenant, a binding agreement, a commitment, or in this case, a recommitment on the part of Israel. So let's get right into chapter 10, okay? Now they bind their hearts together, determined, committed to keeping the law of God that they had been reading. As I said last week, um, there's a progression. The word of God is alive and powerful. It's active, right? So remember we saw in Psalm 19 that the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul, right? It had been working in their hearts. Now it's coming out in their lives, in their actions. Okay, look at chapter 10, verse 1. Now on the sealed document were the names of Nehemiah the governor, the son of Halkaliah and Zedekiah, Sariah, Azariah, Jeremiah, Pashur, Amariah, Malchijah, Hatush, Shebaniah, Malak, Harim, Merimoth, Obadiah, Daniel, Ginnathon, it goes on and on. All the names are written here uh, for the first, um, I think it's 27 or 8 verses, first 27 verses. These were the priests, the Levites, their brothers, and the leaders of the people and their names. The names of those who stepped up to the plate, okay, and uh, signed it. And they sealed it. This is important. They sealed it. After their hearts are broken, they've reflected on God's goodness toward them, right? They've recognized their sinfulness uh, toward God, right? They've confessed and they've asked the Lord to help them. And now they renew their commitment to their obedience to God. Um, and they take it seriously. One translation of the last verse in chapter 9 says, And because of all this... We make a sure covenant and write it. Our leaders, our Levites, and our priests seal it. They seal the deal. They seal the deal. They draw up a covenant in writing, a binding agreement. Um, and uh, this term covenant, or term make a covenant, in the last verse in chapter 9, literally means to cut a covenant. We cut a covenant. The covenants were not made in those days. They were cut. Because almost always, as Noah taught us last week, there's, there, an animal was sacrificed. An animal sacrifice was part of the covenant. And a covenant always costs something. And our point of decision, as it were, will cost us something. The, the Bible calls us to deny the self-life, right? Life of comfort and ease. And, and these are some of the passing pleasures of this world. Count the costs, it's worth it. So here these men say, we will do something about this, is the point. 84 leaders, Nehemiah and 83 other leaders, step up to the plate, willing to put their name on the line for this covenant before the Lord. They show they mean business. They mean business. And that they don't want to just give God, you know, or, 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 or each other lip service, right? They want to really make a commitment. So they truly want to serve him. And they understood that the importance of covenant. They understood, I mean, a covenant, remember, it's a binding agreement between two parties. It's the basis for um, 
relationships um, and, and commitment in marriage, in business, and most importantly, as it's highlighted here, relationship with God, okay? And in fact, all God's relations with mankind are based on covenants. And the people here remembered God made a covenant with Abraham, uh, promising that both a nation and the Messiah would descend from him. He made a covenant with Moses and all of Israel when he gave them the law at Mount Sinai. God also made a covenant with King David, promising the Messiah would come from his family. And I mentioned that last week. He would have a king that would reign, there would be a king that would reign on his throne forever. That's Jesus. That's Jesus. We'll talk more about that. But the greatest covenant, the new covenant instituted by the Messiah was, it was yet to come at this point. It, was, it would be some, some 400 years until Jesus would even step on the scene. But jumping back in our scene here, so they seal the document. Now, this is huge because to put your seal on something back then, right, was um, it was the way that you they let everybody know that they were serious about keeping their word. It also ensured that the person was really there. They were really present and they're the ones that sealed it and signed it. The same way that proving, you know, a, a signature is authentic on, a, on an important document. But this was even more serious. You, you, were, you were binding yourself to this agreement holding yourself fully accountable uh, and leaving no room for yourself to squirm out of it later. You were sealing the deal. Here I am, baby. Signed, sealed, delivered. <laughs> I'm yours. What you were saying to God. So they put their name on the dotted line. This provokes the question, are we, are you and I, are we willing to put our name on the dotted line, confess our sins and, and repent? Are we willing to follow God and let him change us and change the direction of our lives? Here in this dramatic scene, this historic event is taking place and they're, they're proving that they're willing. They're proving that they're willing to, to commit. And I read somewhere that uh, on the signing of the Declaration of Independence um, that John Hancock signed his name first, right? And he was so passionate and so on fire about the thing that he signed in these big, bold, oversized letters Right, so that King George would be able to read it without his glasses on, right? And um, Nehemiah being listed first, you got to wonder if he did the same thing. But because this guy is definitely passionate, right? Nehemiah's got passion and drive and determination, and he's leading the people, and um, and Ezra as well. Interesting, <coughs> excuse me, that he's the first to sign it, as he's a picture of who's Nehemiah a picture of again? The Holy Spirit, right? Holy Spirit. And uh, last week I mentioned that Paul told the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 1, in him, that's in Jesus, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were what? Sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. You were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. I love how the New Living Translation puts it. And now you Gentiles... I've also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit whom he promised long ago. I love that. He sealed you with his spirit, identifying you as his own. With the Holy Spirit, he promised long ago. <clears throat> Another promise God kept. God marks his redemption of you and his commitment to you by sealing you with his Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is God's sign to you that he'll keep every promise because God keeps his covenant. He keeps his covenant. Now, back in chapter 10, verse 28, it says, now the rest, and if it seems like I skipped, I did. Remember the first 27 verses were a bunch of names. Uh, we don't want to reread those, do we? <laughs> Verse 28, now the rest of the people, look at it with me, now the rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, the temple servants, and all those who had separated themselves from the peoples of the lands to the law of God, their wives, their sons, and their daughters, all those who had knowledge and understanding, 29, are joining with their kinsmen, their nobles, and are taking on themselves a curse and an oath to walk in God's law which was given through Moses, God's servant, and 
to keep and to observe all the commandments of God, our Lord, and his ordinances and his statutes, a curse and an oath. So in this covenant, they basically, they agree to accept a curse from God if they don't obey his law. They're willing to accept a curse as a form of God's correction uh, to bring them back to this place of obedience. They're saying, yeah, we bind ourselves to this right now. We're going to obey. And if we don't, we deserve whatever we got coming. They ask God to bless obedience and to curse disobedience. Now, you ever prayed that? God, <laughs> just curse me if I, don't, if I don't follow you with all my heart. I can't say I've done that. I've just said, Lord, just help me walk in your will, right? Help me to follow you wholeheartedly. Make my will your own. I've never said, deal with me <laughs> when I screw up according to your righteousness. I say, Lord, according to your mercy, deal with me, man. According to your loving kindness, man, have patience with me, right? Uh, so they, they take an oath to tie their future to the will of God for them, right? And here's where we see that they highlighted a few specific commands, ones that they'd ignored, that their forefathers had ignored, and caused them all this trouble in the first place. Listen to what they say. If we look at verse 30. And um, verse 30 says, and that, and that we will not give our daughters to the peoples of the land or take their daughters for our sons. Uh, if you remember, I talked about that, how they would do that. They would, for political reasons, a king would do that sometimes. And um, just marry to keep the peace and marry outside of, uh, you know, with these pagan uh, kings, they would have a relative or, or the king himself would marry someone related to the king of a foreign nation. It would just cause all kinds of trouble when they were doing it for political advantage or to keep the peace. But in this case, the people had done this. It had nothing to do with the king. It just They were just rebelling against God. And they get back to it. They say, you know what, we're not going to do this anymore. So it's about uh, separation. If, if you remember last week, we talked about how they... Um, because of how they'd intermarried with pagans and intermingled with the, they, it had caused them to sort of intermingle their worship of God with the practices of those pagans. And they're here they're saying, no more. No more of that. We're going to worship the true and living God. We're not even going to connect ourselves to people that are doing otherwise. This is how serious they are. No more. They stopped intermingling their lives and families with pagans. They stopped sleeping with the enemy, so to speak, is one way to put it. And for us today, we need to be careful about our entanglement, right, with unbelievers. How, <clears throat> how many Christians have, you know, strayed away or, or gotten complacent and found themselves, you know, in trouble after adopting the wrong circle of friends? Right, I've done that, right? And you, what do you say? Man, I knew better. <laughs> I know, but, and you do it, and... I mean, it's like, okay, yeah, that, that chick, she was a bold, Christian, strong believer, always sharing her faith until she made that modeling audition or, you know, got, you know, pushed through on The Voice or America's Got Talent or whatever, you know what I mean? Well, we've seen that happen. They were so bold for Jesus. And then the world accepts them and they, hey, right. I'll, I like this. I like this attention. And they roll with it. Or that guy was an on-fire evangelist until he got that big promotion at work, got that position he was looking for, stopped talking about Jesus around the office, got caught up in all that talk he shouldn't have been talking about, flirting with the chick at the water cooler, as they say, and all that noise. Or that couple was always actively involved, serving in the church. Man, they were, until someone convinced them that, Hey, you know, since they're retired, they should join the, you know, country club or something, you know, or, you know, just go on a, like a, you know, go travel the world and open their mind and relax. And they stop serving. They stop going to church. They stop reading the word. They stop praying together. And they wonder why they find themselves in trouble or without peace. And it always starts with just a little compromise, just a little bit of compromise. And as we look at, um, back at Israel's history, like they did here, that's what always happens to them. That's what always happens to them. So we need to be careful to follow Jesus with all of our heart, right? And, and ask him really, don't get me wrong, because 
we need to ask him, right, for the strength to obey. You and I shouldn't avoid interacting with the world around us. We just shouldn't get attached to them and the things of the world. Um, Vance Habner said, we are not to be isolated but insulated, moving in the midst of evil but untouched by it. Keep a healthy separation. Does that make sense? Let's keep reading. Look at verse 31. 31. As for the peoples of the land who bring wares or any grain on the Sabbath day to sell, we will not buy from them on the Sabbath or a holy day, and we will forego the crops the seventh year and the exaction of every debt. In Exodus, God told Israel to set aside one day in seven to rest, rest their body, right? And one year in seven to rest the land. Um, God had said that no one could buy or sell anything on the Sabbath day. You weren't to work. You weren't to till the ground. You weren't none of that stuff. Or do any business. They had been breaking this law, and now they covenant with God to obey it. Obviously, they, you could you know, make more money, right? They could make more money working seven days, right? You know, if you're open seven days a week instead of six. But it's been said that both soul and soil need to be replenished. Both laws uh, require faith, though. To take off a year or a day to worship God means I'm trusting God to do more with my six than I could do with seven, right? Um, now, this was a big one. This was a big deal because Israel disobeyed the Sabbath for 490 years. That's a long time. That was, you know, if you've been with us through our study back in Daniel, Ezra, now Nehemiah, you know, you might remember that this was why they were in captivity in the Babylonian or Persian Empire for 70 years. 490 divided by 7 is 70. God issued their consequences perfectly according to what he said. And interestingly enough, we saw this amazing prayer in Nehemiah 9, right? You might remember another incredible play, uh, prayer in uh, Daniel chapter 9. You remember that? Daniel 9, it's very similar. Daniel says, Lord, the great and awesome God. Remember, Nehemiah said that. Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love. This is Daniel talking. Keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. We have sinned, Daniel says, and done wrong. We've been wicked and have rebelled. We've turned away from your commands and laws. And he just, he goes on to say, just as it is written, in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come on us, yet we have not sought the favor of the Lord, our God, by turning from our sins and, check this out, giving attention to your truth. And he pleads with God, Lord, listen, right? Listen, please listen. Lord, please heal. Forgive us, Lord. Hear and act for your sake, God. For your sake, O oh God, do not delay, because your city and your people bear your name. Remember, God made a glorious name for himself. So now here, back in the land, temple rebuilt, walls rebuilt, gates repaired, all that stuff, remember, uh, repaired, the, the homes are restored, right? God had their attention, <laughs> and the truth has convicted them now. And the word has moved them to action. So they're renewing their commitment now uh, to the God who's been faithful this whole time, right? Okay, now check it out. Uh, the commitment continues. Verse 32, uh, verses 32 through 39. Another area of decision. God, you see, uh, it's to be faithful in supporting God's work. Uh, verse 32 says, We also placed ourselves under obligation to contribute yearly one-third of a shekel for the service of the house of our God, for the showbread, for the continual grain offering, for the continual burnt offering, the Sabbaths, the new moon, for the appointed times, for the holy things, and for the sin offerings to make atonement for Israel and all the work of the house of our God. A temple tax was imposed on all Jewish worshipers. Nehemiah Nehemiah understood something that's the big picture. He understood, in this case, their walk with God would ultimately only be as strong as the place where, the place where they were fed and led, which was the temple. If you and I would be church, right? And um, 
I think it was Sandy Adams that said, we need the place to go, you and I, to gain strength and remain strong, right? That's why it's important that we give to our church. It's as important that we give to our church as it is that we take from our church. Now, listen, that's not a trip, okay? That's, that's not a trip to get you to give money. You guys know we don't even like talking about money around here, right? It, it does take money to have a service like this every week to serve breakfast, to pay the rent, you know, and all that stuff. Uh, and to do the outreaches that we do during the week, like refuge recovery and, and other things. But look at verse 34 really quick. 34, likewise, we cast lots for the supply of wood among the priests, the Levites, and the people, so they might bring it to the house of our God, according to our father's households at fixed times annually, uh, to burn on the altar of the Lord our God, as it's written in the law. So uh, first they establish a yearly tax, to support the work in the temple, then they require people to bring wood to the temple on like a rotating basis. Um, so they all took turns bringing firewood for the offerings. Maybe you can't support the church financially, right? Maybe you're not in a position to do that, but you know, you can, you can, everyone can bring a little something of value. I'm not saying bring us firewood, I'm just saying. <laughs> Today it would be, you know, maybe you can put some, help put the tables up, right? You can set a, I can set a table up, right? I can slap those tables up and stack some chairs, or I can cook breakfast, or or maybe you can provide food to be cooked, like Monday nights. You know, I you can pick up trash, or you can you can pass out Bibles to people who need a Bible, or lead worship, offer to pray for your pastors and leaders. Man, we would love that. We know you guys do, but maybe if someone asked, would anybody lend, can anyone lend a helping hand? Like, I'm moving this weekend. Can somebody help me move? You know, you could step up and say, yeah, I, I'll do it. Amen? Let's read on. Verse 35. And, and that they might bring the first fruits of our ground and the first fruits of all of the fruit of every tree to the house of the Lord annually. These were things that they were commanded to do back in the law that they had not their forefathers had not been faithful and so they're saying we're going to get back to all of these things that they've missed that we're not going to veer off to the left or the right anymore we're going to stay the course we're going to do what God said we will we will we will if you notice it went from you did this for them and they did this against you and, and so you did this and, and then they turned to we have sinned so we're going to get back to what they and we haven't been doing what we should be doing, okay? Just to throw that in there. And bring to the, verse 36, to bring to the house of our God the firstborn of our sons and our cattle and the firstborn of our herds and our flocks as it is written in the law uh, for the priests who are ministering in the house of our God. 37, we will also bring the first of our dough, our contributions, the first of every tree, the new wine and the oil to the priests at the chambers of the house of our God and the tithe of our ground to the Levites. For the Levites are they who receive the tithes in all the rural towns. First fruits just meant your best. It meant off the top, right? Off the top, not your leftovers, right? The best. You know, if you were harvesting a crop, it, you know, it wouldn't it, you know, you wouldn't take all the best home and then go to the priest with your leftovers or the ones that weren't quite ripe or ready or whatever, you know. You, they were to give their best, right? Firstborn and first fruits were risky ways to give because your land might not yield much more produce. Your cow or whatever might not give birth again, yet the first still belonged to God and was given to the priests. It was just what they did. God promised to bless this giving of first fruits and firstborn in faith. Proverbs 39, don't turn there, but it says, Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase, so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. So in the Old Testament, the first of most of everything belonged to God, and they, they gave him their best. Now, one pastor told a story of a, a cattle rancher who, he says he boasted one day in church that he decided to give one of his, uh, he boasted one day 
that he decided to give one of his newborn calves to the Lord. Right? Two calves were born that night, but he told his wife afterwards, I've got bad news, honey. The Lord's calf was born dead. <laughs> Where was this man's heart? <laughs> right? And I know somebody said, ouch, because we can relate to that, right? Let me see. I don't know, maybe I got a dollar left after I was going to buy all that stuff over the weekend. Man. I'm sorry, Lord. Here you go. Lord, help us. Help us to give you the best, right, of our time, our effort, our talents, and resources. Amen? Now, um, an offering was something that they gave. An offering is something you give, right? A tithe was something that belonged to God. It was required. Uh, 10% off the top, right? Uh, for them, you know, income, like for us today, for them, their wealth was in their, in their, in their farming, their crops, and, and, their, and their cattle and things like that, their, their livestock and their farms, uh, somebody who had a lot of that was rich. Malachi 3 accuses the people of Israel of robbing God by failing to pay their tithes. Now the word tithe means tenth. Okay, so the people tithe to the Levites. Then the Levites tithe to the Lord. Verse 38, the priest, the son of Aaron, shall be with the Levites when the Levites receive the tithes. And the Levites shall bring up the tenth of the tithes to the house of our God to the chambers of the storehouse. Amazingly, there's a lot of debate about this tithing thing. Um, for, and like, is it for us today? Is it in the New Testament? It, it, since we're not under the law, but under grace, do we still tithe and all that stuff? Let me share something with you from Malachi 3 that reveals that tithing is one area of life where God challenges us to test him. It says, try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be enough room to receive it. So if you do tithe, God promises abundant provision. Jesus, in Matthew 23, talks to the Pharisees, condemning them for tithing to the penny, but neglecting more important issues of justice, mercy, and faith. He then goes on to tell them that they should, in fact, tithe, but that they shouldn't neglect the more important things. One church leader said, when we're able to release at least 10% of our income back to God, our money doesn't have as tight a hold on us because we realize God's in control of our finances. We remember that everything we have has been given to us by Him. Even though most of us probably work for the money we make each month, even God has His hand there. He has given us the ability to do our jobs, right? Many who grasp what God has truly given them seem to agree that 10% doesn't even feel like enough. He also said, we're not saved by works, thus failing to tithe will not necessarily send you to hell, but doing so will help improve your life and strengthen your relationship with God. I personally don't believe that God will curse us if we don't tithe, but I do believe he will help us escape the curse that is already in the world if we do. What I think he means is that Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And in the Bible, it has a lot to say about money. Jesus talked about money a lot. And um, Paul talked about money. Scriptures talk about the love of money being a root of all kinds of evil. That if our, our money or our material things have a hold on our heart, then it, it, it hinders us from freely worshiping God by giving and uh, trusting him in that way. Um, but anyway, in the Old Testament, they performed animal sacrifices, right? In the New Testament, Paul says we're to be a living sacrifice, Right? And one of the ways we can do that, besides presenting our bodies to God, is giving of the substance that he provides for us. And, and um, it's his anyway, right? So, but the point in our study is that they had gotten so far from that that they'd suffered for it. Now they're committing to getting back to it, okay? Uh, verse 39, really quick. For the sons of Israel and the sons of Levi shall bring the contribution, the grain, the new wine, and the oil to the chambers there are the utensils of the sanctuary, the priests who are ministering, the gatekeepers and the singers. Thus, we will not neglect the house of our God. Guzik put it like this, simply said, the Bible says we need to be givers, not so much for the sake of those we give to, but because giving sets our heart right about material things. God himself is the greatest giver. So we give the support of missions. Like Chris said, that's our heart. We give to, other, uh, to support other church planters, outreaches in this community and other communities. In case you haven't noticed, we, haven't had a, we don't have a fancy church building or a, um, 
you know, that we meet in every day of the week. And Chris and I don't drive fancy cars and wear suits and, you know, all that stuff. And our, neither do any of our leaders. This is all for the Lord. This is all for the Lord. So, so if you do give to this church, please understand, trust and believe that all of it's going to where we wholeheartedly believe that God has called us to use it. Okay? Um, so the Israelites, they get back to the law. They get back to obeying the word of God. They get back to giving along with obeying the Sabbath and keeping themselves undefiled. No more compromise. They're going to obey the law of the Lord their God. But what about us? What about us? What about you and I? How does this even apply to us today when we get convicted by the word of God? When we, we want to get right again and back to following him with all our hearts, should we make a covenant? Should we actually, uh, Chris said this on Through the Word, should we actually like write out a binding agreement, you know, and put our seal on it and, you know, that, and that we are going to obey every precept and honor God that way? You know, do we take an oath? And actually Jesus said in Matthew 5, you you know, you've heard it said, you know, you shall not swear falsely, but perform your oaths to the Lord. He said, but I say to you, don't swear at all by heaven, by earth, for it's his, for his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it's the city of the great king. Nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your yes be yes and your no, no, for whatever is more than these is from the evil one. In other words, give your word and keep your word. And you and I, uh, in Jesus under the new covenant, aren't bound to the Old Testament laws, but God still calls us to walk in truth and walk in obedience and, and, and to devote ourselves to him. But the wonderful thing is we have this new covenant, right, that, that isn't sealed by us drawing up an agreement, right, and putting our signature or seal on it the way they did in those days with the, with the, uh, the ring and, and, and with the seal they put in hot wax and have the seal there and the image there. No, this covenant is established by the powerful blood of Jesus Christ, and it is sealed by the Holy Spirit right here in your heart, right here in your heart. Can I tell a quick story? <laughs> huh? All right. Well, I guess we're going to have to find out next time. <laughs> um, Colossians 2. 13 says, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Therefore, don't let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival a new moon or celebration or Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. But the reality, however, is found in Christ. The reality is in Christ. When they're wandering in the wilderness, the, 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 the tabernacle would be in the middle. Tabernacle was like a portable temple, so to speak, in church. And they'd have the tribes set up in such a way around the tabernacle that the way they'd move in the formation, if you flew over it from the sky, it would look like a cross. You know, the sun comes from behind you, you know, and your shadow goes before you like that. Imagine seeing that scene and seeing a shadow of the cross all those years ago. Whispers of the cross, even in the wilderness wanderings. They were a shadow of things to come. All these laws, all these regulations. But the substance or the reality is in Christ. Now, we are totally out of time, so we have to close. But you and I can respond to this grace by committing to follow him, following him again. Asking him for the power by his Holy Spirit who lives in us to obey him and faithfully follow him. He'll always be faithful. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. Right? Uh, just as he never forsook Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob, all the way down to Ezra and Nehemiah, the children of Israel, God kept his promise. So, you, or you and I wouldn't be here today. If you're here and the Word of God has convicted you, you need to come to Jesus today, or you need to recommit to Him today. You know you've broken God's laws. You know you haven't walked with Him faithfully. You know, just respond to His grace by saying, you know what, I just, I just want to come to you, Lord. We want to pray with you. So if that's you, just to cut it short, um, I'll be down here to pray for you guys. Just uh, let's respond to him in prayer.
uh, together. Father God, thank you for your word. Uh, just thank you, Lord, that it's your word. It's your grace, Lord. It's your truth. It's your spirit, Lord, that prompts any, everything that we do. Lord, it's your word that gives us life. Lord, we want to respond to your life-giving word by receiving that life. And we want to respond to your call to follow you by following you. So empower us to do that, Lord. It's easy for us to look at the children of Israel and say, those knuckleheads. So much more I wanted to say today, Lord, but really the bottom line is you are good. You are faithful. We do not deserve your grace, but we are thankful that you have provided a way to be reconciled to you, to be completely saved and transformed, Lord. We're asking for you to continue that transformation in us that know you. And Lord, for you to draw those to yourself today that don't, that have never responded to the gospel, Lord. Let them believe that you died for their sins, Lord, and you rose from the grave. You're coming again, Lord, and you want us to, walk, to follow you until you come and occupy by telling others this message of grace and truth. Father, we just trust you and, and give you the rest of this day, all of our cares, all of our concerns, everything that we are, Lord, all of our failures, all of our hopelessness, all of our dreams, all that we are. We surrender. And we admit we need you. So come to us, Lord Jesus. Renew us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You have my heart And I'm yours forever You are my strength God of grace and power And everything you hold in your hand Still you make time for me I can't understand Praise you God of earth.